right, so uh, here we are again, another webinar. Uh, this is the open floor Q and A uh, webinar. So if you got any questions, feel free to put them in the Q and A section, uh, at the bottom of your Beam window there, or not Beam, but your Zoom window. Um, me and James were just talking about uh, Beam backup. So Freudian uh, slip, will it happen? Yeah. Uh, with no further ado, though, the, um, James is joining me today. Um, he is a senior technician and team lead with Abacus Technologies. So um, he will be helping me out uh, addressing this, some of these uh, questions that might, uh, that might come through. So we'll just uh, give you guys a couple seconds here to um, put some questions out there. We will address them uh, to the best of our ability. Keep in mind that there's uh, no stupid questions. Bring it on, we'll, we'll answer uh, We'll answer anything that comes through. So we'll just give a couple minutes here and let those pop through. Here comes a couple already. Um, let's see, let's start with this one. This is a good one. Um, what are some of the best ways to identify phishing emails? James, you want to uh, chime in on and what are some of the ways you yeah. identify phishing emails? Man, probably the most important thing to look out for is is who it's coming from for a phishing email. Um, in almost all scenarios, when it comes across the board, hits your inbox, it's going to look like it's coming from one person, one business entity, or another in the body of that message. But uh, the the sender address is almost always going to be something randomized or weird or odd. It should be the first thing you look at when something comes in and, and, and you question it. Say, do I know this person? Do I know, know this organization? And more, more often than not, the answer is no. Um, could be coming from a completely random address that has nothing to do with the FedEx email or Amazon delivery confirmation you you're think you're getting uh, for sure. So that'd be the first thing I would look for. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And, you know, even the display name, it might look like or have the display name of somebody you might know. Yeah. However, like James pointed out, in the actual address in there, that can be, uh, it's typically different. And like James said, it's something random. So um, I, I agree. That's that's the first place to look. Yeah. Um, anything Black else? System. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, on that thought, you mentioned the, the display names. Um, that's something that a lot of people do, ourselves included. Uh, we will have, you know, mail rules in place where if that display name doesn't match the email address, or just if it's simply coming from outside the organization, uh, it'll throw a security warning on there too, just to let you know yeah. that it it's not who it is not from who you believe it is. Just to give you one more little little bit of visual information uh, to to look at that message and, and decide if it's legitimate or not. Yeah, and you know, always a fail safe too is it never hurts to to reach out to that person that sent you the email possibly, and just ask them if they, hey, did you send me this email? Uh, yep. Just to confirm, you know, if it looks suspicious or if it's got odd uh, subject or body to the email, you know. It doesn't hurt to pick up the phone, call the person, make sure it's legitimate, especially if it's sensitive information or yeah. you know, a, a sensitive request for information or something like that. So. Or if they ask you to transfer thousands of dollars to a banking account, uh, that's always worth, always worth picking up the phone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. To check with somebody. Just exactly. In case. Just in case. Let's see what else we got here. Um, on the subject of phishing emails and security, we'll jump into, uh, somebody's asking, why is uh, multi-factor authentication important and uh, how does it protect you? <clears throat> so, well, Lee, you wanna take this one? I, the last I, one. I, can, I can start. Yeah, multi-factor authentication, it just provides a second layer of requested credentials um, that will be delivered typically via text message or a phone call to help uh, prove you are who you say you are. So once you receive that text message or phone call, we'll have a code of random characters 
then you provide that and that'll actually let you authenticate um, into uh, whatever you're trying to access. Um, how does it work? Pretty much when you authenticate the first time, it sends uh, an, an, a likely or the same request to uh, a multi-factor provider, whether it's uh, dual authentication or off point. They receive that, they send a text message or a phone call to the user. That user provides uh, that second layer of authentication. So uh, it's definitely a good practice to put in place because it's just one more hoop the bad guys have to jump through. And there's really no good way for them to, to crack that unless they do it through like a phishing email and stuff like that. So you got anything to add on that as far as multi-factor? Yeah, the, the thought that always comes to mind with multi-factor is that, you know, they're asking for more than one thing for you to be able to log into your account. Uh, the way somebody described it to me at one point was uh, we ask for something that you know and we ask for something that you have when you go to log into an account. So I know my password. I have my phone. Absolutely. So regardless of what means they, they have set up a multi-factor on a, on a mobile device, um, that's something I have. I physically have. It acts as almost as a key. So you have Lord knows how many solutions for you know that kind of that kind of deal, but it could be as something as simple as uh, you know, UB keys. Those are extremely popular. Yeah. Uh, that's a that's a truly a physical device. Uh, or in years past, you know, they had uh, little fobs that the bank would issue <laughs> with a constantly generating code, but you know, phones made that less of an issue now. Um, I, I, I know we have the stats somewhere in one of Brian's previous presentations, but you know, turning on multi-factor is probably one of the most powerful tools you can have to prevent account compromise. Um, it, it, it feels kind of like car salesman to say, but it's like a 99% protection rate. Uh, on that kind of situation to keep people out of your accounts. So it's extremely powerful, very worthwhile to put in place. And I'm going to add to that question. I'm going to throw a question out there for you to answer too, James. Um, okay. What can be protected, protected by multi-factor authentication? Oh, man. Uh, if you can name it, yeah. you can probably protect it with multi-factor. There um, you go. Yeah. You're giving me a good segue, Lee. That's really <laughs> Uh, yeah, if you could, seriously, if you can name it, you can probably protect it with, with multi-factor. So uh, a number of the systems that everybody uses day-to-day uh, -day, uh, can be protected by multi-factor just in the systems that they provide. Uh, so office.com, for example, they, they include that with every single account. You can set up multi-factor on your accounts. Um, probably what you would see on like a, a more like high tier corporate level uh, would be something like a, a single sign on multi-factor setup. And that's what off points doing. That's what duo is doing. Uh, when you see those in place, uh, you have a single system that you can sign into that is multi-factor and it ties to all sorts of different other systems, depending on the need. So if you see somebody working with that kind of uh, setup, that's, typically well-refined um, and, and a great way of, of handling authentication to applications, software. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm gonna jump ahead, I'm kind of reading some of the questions that come through here, but while we're on the subject of MFA and phishing emails, we got the question, what do you, uh, what do you feel is the biggest risk uh, for a small business? Um, I think, you know, I think uh, email phishing attempts I think that's the gateway. The, the, you know, it's an easy one. It targets all your end users. Yeah. Um, I just think that you know, once they get in your email, you might not even know, but they have nothing but time on their hands, and they can figure all, out a lot about your company and your personnel and decision yeah. makers through email fairly quick. And they can also set up email rules, forwarding. Um, stuff like that, you know, 
the more if they gain access. Yeah, 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 exactly. But if they do, uh, you know, emails, there's a lot of information in there that people don't realize, especially if they got time to go through. And so I think that's the big, biggest risk. Do you have anything to add to that other than email, James? Um, probably it's in the same line of thought, but uh, people, people are the biggest risk most of the time. So, you know, as, as much as some of these subject matters, it might feel like we're harping on them. They are targeted in a big, big way, most especially employees. So you mentioned, you know, leadership being targeted in those kind of situations. hundred percent. You know, if your name is on the letterhead, you will probably be the first person to receive some kind of phishing scam because uh, you're associated with the company publicly, um, uh, whether it be information on the website, uh, general information about the business, who's registered to it, who's an owner, who's a COO, so on and so forth. Um, so not only just protecting those people, but you know, the, the people themselves are a risk factor. So we want to make sure that everybody goes into these situations well-equipped, well-educated, yeah. so they know how to avoid these scenarios or what to do if it does happen. Yeah, be able to recognize these scenarios before they make a mistake. Yep, 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 absolutely. Yeah, and if you've got uh, RDP open to the world, that's pretty bad, Jim. We've seen oh, that's, yeah, that's a huge one. We have seen or heard more horror stories about that than anything else. Can, can you uh, can you like speak at length about that one? I, I know that I know that feels like a checklist sort of item, yeah, things yes. to look for, but you know. So RDP remote desktop protocol. We used to see it a lot. I don't see it as much now, but what that does is allow you uh, a remote desktop connection from anywhere in outside of your network. So if you go home, you can RDP. You know, use an IP address. RDP into your computer at the office or the server at the office and get to work. Here's the catch. Uh, if you can do it from anywhere, so can the bad guys. So uh, we've seen it time and time again where we'll have a customer call us with issues or we'll pick up a company uh, that we're onboarding and we'll see, we'll check out the firewall, we'll see RDP open and you can look at the server and it's just getting hammered with login attempts. Yeah. Um, you, typically, they leave that open. There's a, a weak password policy also involved. Yep. Um, so, but you know, there's guys out there. You know, bad guys are out there just scanning for IP addresses, see what ports are open, what they could do with it. Yeah. So. Uh, the phrase um, "it's not if, but when" yeah. comes to mind. Yeah. With those situations, it's a. Uh, I know anytime we run across it, like you said, it, it's, it's a hot button item. Uh, we're going to try to address that as quickly as possible. Absolutely. Let's jump down the list here. We got a couple of um, backup questions. Uh, what backup solutions or services does Abacus offer? Um, I'll run with that. We basically offer two solutions. One is a full-blown continuity plan, which includes uh, a data appliance, full server image backups, and um, the ability to virtualize those servers on the appliance if need be. Uh, so meaning if your server goes down due to a hardware failure and it's going to take you three days to get the replacement part, you can spin it up virtually on the data appliance and your downtime is, you know, minutes compared to days to get the part. Um, our other one is a Beam backup solution, and it's strictly just a backup solution. It's uh, not a continuity plan at all, but uh, it does take server uh, image level backups, still keeps them on site, and we also have a process that pushes those off site to a secure location to where if you got hit with ransomware, your backups don't get encrypted also. So those are the two backup solutions we offer and stand by. James, do you have any, any other information you want to put on that? Um, I would just stress the, the differences, honestly, um, as, much, as much as possible, really. Because yeah, you said Veeam is truly it's a backup solution, but you know, Datto itself, 
is a continuity plan as well. Um, it, it is not just going to take those backups and shove them off site. Uh, it's very important to know that that device also lets you recover on the spot. Like you said, you can recover on the spot, you can recover in a virtual data center off site. So no matter the situation, whether it's you know, physical compromise of the data center you might have on site, uh, say there's a giant storm, the building's not, uh, knocked over, uh, well, data means we can start those servers up remotely and your business can continue regardless of the physical status of the building. Um, same thing with ransomware on the spot. Uh, and we've had that happen firsthand. I've seen it firsthand more than once where businesses hit with ransomware and we made the decision right then and there to virtualize the entire business on the data, on the spot there, uh, from the day prior before there was an issue. So extremely powerful tool. Um, and Lee, you missed one. There's a third backup option too. Hmm. Well, before you get to it, I think I failed to mention the data also replicates the, the, the everything offsite. I think I failed to mention that. that, was a little bit about that. What did I? What did I? What did I miss? Well, it's a quiz. It's a quiz. Lee. You got. You got. You got to see. Can you? Can you figure it out? Sounds like a trick question, not a not a quiz. No, no, it's it's not a trick question. Data SaaS. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Why don't you explain that to me? Yeah. Uh, so data SaaS. Uh, is basically a means that we can back up your Office 365 environment. Um, and as time has gone on, that has uh, gotten more and more feature rich. Uh, so now at this point, it will do constant snapshots of people's mailboxes, uh, their SharePoint sites, their OneDrive data, and Teams now too. That just showed up in there recently. Uh, so people have you know, Teams collective uh, chats or, or uh, like group chats uh, in the application, those can get backed up as well. So in the event of any sort of issue with individual accounts, uh, man, that's a super powerful tool to be able to roll back changes. If you have an employee that gets a little crazy with the delete button, maybe say right as you go through a termination process for them, <laughs> uh, you can roll those changes back if need be. Um, I think it's I think it's important too to keep in mind just because that data is out in the cloud doesn't mean it's safe or it's getting you know don't assume it's just getting backed up because chances are it's not I right. can almost guarantee you that it's not and it's not safe right. either uh, from ransomware or rogue mm -hmm. employees or anything like that so yeah yep, Microsoft is interested in uptime yep. that is what their concentration is in, in their platform yep. not with retention. Right. So, uh, if you're anybody who is concerned about retention of your data, backup of, the, of that data, uh, you're right. Just because it's not in the building on a server uh, doesn't mean that it is entirely deserving of being backed up in some way, shape, or form. Absolutely. While we're on the backup subject, James, uh, let's see here. Why is full system backups uh, why are full system backups important? What are they? Um, most of the time, I, I, I assume the question is uh, really geared more towards, uh, if you're doing a full system backup, that, that takes a, an image of that machine at that point in time. So it's fully recoverable up to that point. If you're not doing a full system backup, that probably just means you're doing probably just means you're doing the file backup, which is okay. Um, but you, you always want to be able to return uh, those servers, you know, back to a previous point in time easily. If you can only do a file backup, you can only pull files back uh, later on down the road. Yeah. And, and the recovery time is a lot oh, yeah. harder. Assuming you have one server, it goes down. Well, you have to have a, another server or something to, restore this file level backup from. I'm not saying file level right. backups are bad, but- uh, It's just uh, not enough in most situations. Yeah, uh, you know, a, a full system backup is kind of two, two birds in one stone because it typically gives you the option to do file level restores 
if you just need to restore a file. So uh, That's right. yeah, it's just kind of a two birds, one stone uh, kind of deal. So if, you, if you're using some backup software and you have the option to do uh, system image backups or system backups, full system backups, I would strongly recommend those. Uh, you, can't, you can't go wrong with that. Yeah. File backups aren't really backups at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Most of the way there. They're just, they're just not all the way there. That's right. Uh, here's a good one. We're going to change subjects here and get off the backup stuff. We can talk about that all day. Um, this one's pertaining to updates. How often should I update my computer? What's the difference between an update and an upgrade? Okay. Um, we'll break that up. We'll kind of break that question up into, there's, into three different sections here. Let's first let's talk about operating systems and we'll kind of stick with Windows for for all purposes. Um, so yeah, why is it important to, to update uh, your Windows operating system, James? Uh, update the operating system? Yep. Uh, most of the time we are, uh, when we're talking about operating system updates, like I said, we're talking about Windows updates. Um, we're a far cry from where we used to be years and years ago, where they would issue a dozen security patches every week. Yep. Uh, and, and we all hoped to God that everything turned out okay after they finished those updates. Uh, for the most part now, for the most part, uh, Microsoft Windows has shifted to a monthly security patch. So they'll make a number of security improvements that, that should be applied to your machine every month. So I, I hope that regardless of who we're talking to, at the very least, like that is happening uh, across the board uh, to catch those monthly security updates from. Yeah. The I think that's the big question there, the security updates, yeah. getting those installed. Uh, yeah. Vulnerabilities are constantly found and, um, you know, Microsoft is, is pushing out the patches as, as, as quick as they possibly can or when they become uh, aware of, of, of the vulnerability. So. Yep. And if you're on uh, an older operating system, um, they don't care so much to issue those security patches anymore. Not so much anyway. Uh, so if you find your machine is falling behind and it's say on something like a Windows 7, uh, or Windows 8, I guess, at this point, here soon. I think, I think 8's out of life. I'm not sure about 8.1. It might still yeah. be covered, but I think 8's already end of life. Yeah. Yeah. Worth looking at, to be sure. Um, yeah, most everyone who starts up a Windows machine these days, it's going to get those monthly roll-ups. Uh, but hey, always worth checking. Always worth checking. Absolutely. Um, and while we're on operating systems, I think it'd be easy to cover um, the update versus upgrade. Um, an upgrade would actually be an actual version change of the operating mm. system and or a whole, a whole version. Like a lot of people don't know this, Windows 10 has a bunch of different versions you have, you know, you have to upgrade, whether it be uh, 1703, then 1803, 1903. I believe those were the version numbers. 2004 now. Is it 2004 now? Yeah. Yep. So that's... Every six months later. That clockwork. <laughs> that clockwork. It's coming. And, you know, or if you wanted to upgrade from, let's say, Windows 8 to Windows 10, it's a full version upgrade. Um, by the way, I wouldn't recommend... I'm not a huge fan of in-place upgrades of operating systems. I'd rather just wipe it reinstall it fresh but uh, it is an option out there uh, let's talk about third-party applications I think this kind of goes in the phone apps too, kind of what we discovered um, all this stuff all this software written whether it's a phone app or Adobe or Java or any you know anything we refer to as a third-party application they're vulnerable uh, and they're constantly pushing out patches for those. So it's important not only to keep your operating system up to date, but these applications that are running on your computer, they don't need to be neglected either. Running you know, the latest versions, make sure they're patched, 
that's even, you know, it's Chrome, um, you name it, Firefox, your browsers. Um, it's just important to, to install those. I know I'm guilty of this when my phone apps, I'll go to the app store and I'll look at it like, oh, I'm pinning, you know, 31 <laughs> updates <laughs> to do them all in one swoop. But, um, but those, are, those are equally vulnerable. Yeah, yeah they, they can be. And we store more and more information on our phones as time goes on. So, uh, on the subject of the third-party apps, like you, you mentioned, Chrome, you know, as an example, uh, Chrome is a good example of a third-party application that tends to patch itself um, uh, almost to uh, an annoying degree. I've had a lot of times <laughs> where you know I've. I've had Chrome open for two weeks and, and it's raising its hand and saying, Hey, um, now would be a really good time for us to update. It's been a while. Uh, so they, they will get incessant. They will ask the question of, Hey, I need to update and I need to update now. Um, we do have third party patching as a part of, uh, uh, our support agreements that we have. So, Lots and lots of customers have third-party patching enabled where our backend systems will run those updates um, ideally after hours, if, if I'm speaking correctly, Lee, correct me if I'm wrong, but after hours so that you don't get those kind of notifications and you do have the certainty that those applications are, are getting updated um, without having to necessarily have hands-on to you know, run it yourself. Yeah, James, that's a great point. We, uh, we have a monitoring agent and that helps us have a center point to uh, install Windows updates and install these third party application updates. Um, so we don't have to go chase them down and manually do it or use uh, the, the built in Windows updates. Uh, our monitoring agent actually takes care of all that for us and you know, gives us alerts and notifications and information uh, off, of, off of that. So. We're going to jump gears here. I'm going to go back, uh, back to the basics here for you, James. Uh, mm -hmm. What's the difference between an inkjet and a laser jet printer? Oh, man. Um, God, miles of difference, basically, Lee. <laughs> uh, we, we don't see them so much anymore, at least in like a typical office scenario. But uh, and I'm, guessing, I'm, I'm guessing you're referring to an inkjet. Yeah, sorry. That's right. Sorry. Uh, inkjet printers uh, is really what we were used to seeing uh, in people's homes for a long, long time. And that's still the case most of the time. But uh, an inkjet printer will actually have a little nozzle that sprays the ink back and forth, back and forth on the page. Um, and those have a tendency to dry out. That, that's why you always feel like uh, you don't have any ink is because they're constantly drying out. You may use it uh, one week for 50, 60 pages. Then you don't print anything for a month. And at that point, everything's dried out and it's no good anymore. Uh, we, we do try to stress, uh, especially, especially like in an office scenario, that people go with a laser jet instead. Uh, that has toner that is put onto the page and there's like a heat transfer that happens where it deposits that toner on the page um, instead of using the traditional ink. Uh, so it's, there's all sorts of reasons I would say to go for a laser jet instead, Lee. Probably the one that convinces people the most is the cost yeah. um, of, the, of the print job. You can get toner for a laser jet printer that has like a 3,000 page yield or something like that. Yeah. It goes a long, long way. Um, so numbers, numbers game on that for sure. Yeah. yeah, the problem is there too is, you know, a lot of times people print from home, they want to print in color. Mm -hmm. Well, you get a color laser jet printer and you've got, you know, your four different drums or I believe it's four different drums that they have in there and it gets, it gets pricey. But, they, yeah, it's and a big printer a lot of times. Yep, and they're and they're bulky, but man, the speed and the quality is bar none. Yep, you know it's one of those things you get what you pay for. Yep, I, I had an old Dell laser jet, and I ran that thing for for years and years. I don't do a whole lot of printing, but James talked about the ink going dry and stuff like that on the ink jet. This thing sat there for probably a year and didn't print out a sheet of paper, and I needed to print again. 
I mean, just fired up. Tax season, probably. No, probably, probably. <laughs> probably. <laughs> so, yeah, that's a good answer there. Um, looks like we're kind of whittling down on, we got two more questions to get to. Um, let's go, I'm going to narrow it down to some Office 365 questions here. Okay. Um, uh, why can't I install Office Suite from my Office 365 portal login? Um, what, was the, what was the question? Why can't I install the Office Suite from my Office 365 portal? Um, uh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, typically that comes down to licensing. Uh, there are hmm. some Office 365 license out there that um, just include a mailbox or a mailbox only. Um, my guess is that's what you probably have. Uh, I know they have like a couple different ones. One's just a E1 license where it's just a online only. Another one's E something, I don't know, the licensing uh, yep. structure is pretty robust, I guess I should say. But uh, another one will let yeah. you have, let you uh, allow you to connect up Outlook or an email client to it. And then there's another one uh, like the business premium that comes with the full office suite where you can download it on that, the five devices. I um, yeah. But that would be my best guess is you probably don't have the correct license to install the suite. Um, yeah, you got to think that to that James pretty much wraps that one up. Uh, just as far as the licensing is concerned, you know, it, it, there's a million options under the sun when it comes to Office 365 licensing. You know, everything from I'm a student at home to I'm a corporate business with 10,000 employees. So um, choosing the right license for your scenario, uh, really, really helpful. You know, not all, not all licenses they offer uh, are created equal. So, you know, if you're somebody who's in need uh, of the office suite, you know, please, you know, make sure you have a conversation with us and we will help guide you to a license that, that fits, fits the business. Fits the yeah. Person. And the good thing about Office 365 is, you know, you've got the wrong license, buy the right license. You know, it's really easy to, to change and move back and forth. You don't need this yeah. suite, you know, you can dumb the license down. So that's the kind of nice thing about pay as you go subscription based stuff uh, with Office 365. Flexibility. Absolutely. Good flexibility. Absolutely. And um, this is a good one since it's kind of around Office 365. Uh, what's the difference between OneDrive and SharePoint? It's a great question. Why don't you go with that, James? Uh, difference between OneDrive and SharePoint. Um, technically, they are the same platform, but they do have different uses. So. Uh, what we see is you know, OneDrive is really, really a one-for-one -one like Dropbox was for years ago. It, it's, you know, it's a private storage solution. If you have data that you need to keep, uh, work product that you need to keep for yourself, it needs to go to OneDrive. Um, as soon as we start talking about large teams of people, so if you have, uh, say, a whole marketing group, that needs to come together and work on data at the same time, then they need SharePoint. SharePoint is the, the answer to that, where instead of me having a, a private share, like in OneDrive, I need to work with several people all at the same time. So they load their data into SharePoint, and that information shows up on your computer just like it does with OneDrive. Click a couple of buttons, and uh, that data shows up just like it was sitting in OneDrive or maybe more comparatively, uh, like a classic mapped drive would be on a okay. server. What it uh, looks like. Yeah, yeah, it, it looks and acts like that for sure. Um, got a ton of control when it comes down to who has access to what in, in those SharePoint sites is, is what they call them. They call them SharePoint sites. Um, typically pretty easy to uh, set yourself up to where you can have it based around some sort of logical group uh, in the business that all needs to work together to share data. 
Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, once again, flexibility there. Um, yeah. Access the same data across multiple machines or devices. Um, you can access it via web browser only, or you can actually sync that data to your uh, to your machine. Um, yep. One, the thing I think that could thing that I think confuses people is OneDrive is actually the avenue to sync. That tool syncs the SharePoint data, so I could see where that kind of would get confusing. Yeah. Um, because SharePoint does rely on OneDrive to sync that data back and forth from your machine. Yeah, but once you set it up, that's that's basically it. You don't have to worry yeah. about it again. Yeah, and it's not like there's really any special setup to it. You authenticate through um, the OneDrive, and then you're good to go. So uh, that's all the questions we got posted right now. Um, Yes, you know, I think we've got everybody's questions answered. So with that being said, we'll wrap everything up. I don't have a nice slide to show everybody uh, prepared like Brian usually does, but um, you know, if you need to contact us, feel free to, to reach out to Caroline uh, or, or, or Caroline Lusher or Brian Jackson uh, here at Abacus Technologies, or give us a call, our number is 205. Four four three five nine nine nine. Uh Jane, any any closing thoughts? Nope. Just thanks for having me. Appreciate right. it. Thanks. Thanks for helping me out. And uh, with that being said, we'll call it we'll call it a meeting. Thanks guys. Appreciate all the questions. Thanks.